Welcome back to our month on navigating relationships. In our first Toolbox episode of this month, we took a step back and we talked about dealing with uncertainty in relationships in general. Then we examined navigating a leadership role at work and those four tasks we need to do from the start of day one. We also ended that episode with a question that we get many times. How do I find new friends after I move to a new city? In the second Toolbox episode of this month, we talked about going into a committed relationship and maybe even moving in together and some of the ways in which to talk about finances with your partner and why this is so important. Lastly, we gave some tips on how to deal with romantic relationships that are growing apart. In today's episode, we're going to talk with David Romanelli. In 2017, David began a series of events he called Drinks With Your Elders. In those, he brought the younger generation, as well as people in their 80s, 90s, and even 100s together, and gave the elders a stage to share their stories and life experiences. Out of this came a best-selling book, Lessons from the Oldest and Wisest. In that book, he shares the wisdom that they shared with him at these events and in interviews. That book combines almost 2,000 years of life experience. We're so excited to have you join us here today, David. Thank you. Great to be with you guys. Now... In your interviews with elders, you speak about those that are in their 80s, 90s, and sometimes even 100 years old. Why did you choose to talk to your elders? It goes back to uh, my last surviving grandparent. She was in an old age home, really nice old age home in, in LA. And I saw that it felt like we put her out to pasture. She was disconnected. She didn't have a voice in, in popular culture. She was lonely. And yet she had so much wisdom, so much to share. And I started to realize, hey, there's this huge disconnect here. And why are we not more connected with the oldest and wisest in our communities? Well, and you know, your book combines 2000 years of life experience. Who doesn't want that knowledge? And we were talking just before on our way over here today. And, you know, we see elders, elders in certain cultures being revered, like in Native American Indians and in Asian cultures, and we just don't have that here in America, and it's a, and it's a shame because, well, of course you're going to learn a lot, and this is why we were so excited to be talking to you today. Thank you. Yeah, it's 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 like you turn on the light for people, and we have these Instagram uh, stars with huge followings and. And we look to them for wisdom. And then there's like the 97 year old Holocaust survivor who's sitting alone at the old age home. And it just it feels like there's a disconnect and a conversation to, to kind of fire up. And it's fun for us because normally we talk about how to connect and relate to people who are of your generation, who are your age. That's what most of our audience wants to do. But when we think about a lot of the anxiety that drives our feelings and emotions now in our youth is around things that honestly our elders have lived through, experienced, move well beyond, and could probably let us in on a little secret that it's not that big of a deal, right? <laughs> the perspective that that generation, I mean, you talk to somebody who fought in World War II, talk to somebody who survived the Holocaust, and sometimes people have stories about the Great Depression, and it's like, it puts everything in perspective. Right, you talk about you know, hashtag first world problems and the things that we stress about, right? No Wi-Fi, the wires are crossed. Oh, there's buzzing in my headphones, right? These are things that the greatest generation laugh at as how could this be a struggle? Well, I think that's where the issue is. Like it was yesterday I had saw an article where this Instagram model's uh, account had been deleted and she had posted a new one and she was crying because she didn't know what to do with the rest of her life. And, you know, imagine this, that she's going to ask her 90 year old grandmother what to do in this moment. And her grandmother's like laughing, like, listen, it's not a big deal. You're going to get over. And it's like, grandma's just not getting it. Okay. Like forget her. I can see where that disconnect will lie because there's not going to be much empathy for your Instagram account getting deleted when she had just rolled through the depression or, or whatever it might be. Right. Yeah, and it's, it's not to take away. I mean, our problems are real and, you know, the headaches are real. But it's not to take away from, from our problems, but to sit in a room and, and actually listen to somebody who went through that stuff and, and give them a chance to share their story. You never forget it. It's much different than watching the History Channel or reading it in a book. So, And, I mean, talk about resilience, right? Living through some of those tragedies builds a level of resilience that a lot of us just haven't had the life experience to even build. 
Yeah, and that's why I think the intergenerational mix, I mean, because it's not just learning from their resilience, but the older people, they need our energy and they need our attention, they need our help. So it's a great exchange. And I think what's so fascinating is you you look at both ends, both generations, and here with the youth, they're feeling more and more disconnected and more lonely, and technology is fueling a lot of that. And you look at our elders, and much like that family member of yours, right? They're off in an old age home, typically by themselves. They don't have, their partners have not survived with them. Their friends have passed away. And they're sitting there in loneliness. And taking some time to bridge that gap, I think is just so key. Yeah, the loneliness is, I mean, it's an epidemic. If You know, there's, I think there's a statistic, like it's like when you're really lonely, it's the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And every, most everyone I know has some kind of loneliness, spending 10 hours a day looking at a screen. Mm -hmm. And you can get away with it. I mean, for days and weeks at a time, you just kind of burrow into your screen. We go from one screen to the next, and we forget how good it feels to have a, a human experience. And for some of these people that you had a chance to sit down and have a conversation with, you know, how connected do they feel to their family members and to their community? Are, are they truly as isolated as we think? It depends. I mean, more often than not, they're sort of at the, the inflection point where it could go either way. I think that's what you commonly see. Um, but sometimes you see somebody who has incredible vitality and usually they're part of like a community. Like one guy who's 101 goes to his synagogue like five, five days a week and engages with the children, engages with the community. And then there's people who I met in New York City who feel invisible to the world, even though they're in the busiest city in the world. So it really varies. And I think it, with that idea of being part of community can fuel that vitality, can fuel that youth. And I feel like as we move to more and more loneliness, depression creeps in and that's really when your health starts to wane. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a big issue that's becoming a bigger issue. And I think it's it's important right now, you know, with all the technology becoming more efficient and more integrated, we have to take a stand in some way where we, we bring more human interaction into our lives. Well, and if you polled, uh, m most people would say that they, they would want community and they would interact in a community that they that would share their interests. But when the actuality is, and we've experienced this, when you present a lot of people with this opportunity, they're like, yeah, I'm busy this week because, you know, leaving the house and have to meet new people and it's being intimidating, in, it's intimidating. And we've, you know, we we're trying to make these experiences uh, as, as least jarring as, as possible. I mean, but it's always for all of us when we put ourselves in these situations, even for us last week, doing something for the first time, uh, going to do the Tough Mudder. Once you're in it, you're like, thank God I'm left the house. You're in it. Yeah. No, I mean, when I do these drinks with your elders events, it's like pulling teeth to get people to do something that's different, to go come and talk to their elders. It's like, why would I do that? You know, I can just watch TV tonight. That's so much easier. So putting yourself into a new situation is not easy, but it's so rewarding when you hear stories from a completely different era that you're not going to hear about when you're hanging out with your friends. And our society is segregated by age, and we need to shuffle the deck on that. I would think when you tell most of the people about this, you know, oh, we're doing this thing, it's drinks, oh, that sounds amazing. You're like, oh, well, it's tomorrow night at eight o'clock. Like, oh, yeah, well, uh, I, you know, I got something going on. Is it the uh, Pistons uh, on tonight? Yeah, the playoff game is coming up. <laughs> It, that's exactly what happens. It's not, it's like I was saying, I got come from the yoga world and 20 years ago we were promoting yoga in the community. It was hard to get people to come to yoga class and now you're promoting come listen to your elders and it's, it's hard to get people to show up. But I do believe that our society's trending and people are gonna want more connection with the elder generations. Now I think for a lot of us, myself included, when I think about the elders in my family, there is a little bit of intimidation around this age gap and how do I navigate that and how do I spark conversation? Did you feel intimidated when you started sitting down with elders, especially elders you didn't know? I still do. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm married now and I don't, I don't go to bars and, and you know, have that lifestyle. But when I approach an elder for the first time, it's almost like that kind of shyness and I don't know if they're gonna engage with me. So it's almost still a little bit awkward, but 
after a, a maybe an awkward moment, they're all they're so grateful and so appreciative that a younger person took the time to engage, to ask them how they're doing. Because most of the time, younger people see older people as obsolete, taking up space. They wouldn't have anything interesting to share. It's just the stereotype, unfortunately. Yeah, and to Johnny's point, you know, I think as we've moved as a society, we have come to a place now where we're not seeing our elders move back in with us and and be nurtured in their old age but instead we're leaving that to professionals we're parking them in boca raton we're putting them somewhere else and then you know we get the occasional visit but outside of that occasional visit they're not really getting the communication it's certainly not someone sitting down to listen to those stories yeah it's not it's not in the kind of the fabric of american culture you know it's like we're very about individuality and everyone's gonna follow their own path and coming together, bringing the extended family together is not really the way that we do it, but people pay the price. I mean, there's a lot of loneliness and a lot of separation and we can do better. We have to do better. And one of the most common questions we get asked here, and, and obviously social media is fueling this, is how do I stop comparing myself to others? And you got a great story, some advice from an elder that I thought was pretty poignant. Yeah, there was a, this lady, Linda Jones, and she, her dad was the iconic uh, illustrator, Chuck Jones, who created a lot of the Looney Tunes. And when she was, Linda Jones was young, she felt badly because she wasn't kind of keeping up with her father's success. So she wrote him a letter, because back then they wrote letters. And he wrote, she wrote him a letter and said, Dad, I, I feel badly about myself. I'm not keeping up with your success. And, and he wrote her back and he said, Linda, get the fuck off my mountain. You have your mountain to climb, I have mine. And she said she snapped into place and realized, you know, it wasn't her destiny to try to keep up with her father. And I thought it was such great advice, you know, to, to follow your own path and don't compare yourself to everyone else. Yeah, look at it as your own mountain. And we're all, to that matter, at different places on the mountain, right? Someone else's mountaintop is gonna be different than your own. And I think that's really powerful. Yeah, and you know, another interesting thing, when I talk to a lot of old people, you almost never hear them brag about their accomplishments in life. You know, it's like the greatest accomplishment is not what you have to show for yourself, but who's showing up for you. And that's really refreshing to hear that they don't, they don't talk about how much money they made in the mountains they, they climb. They talk about the love that they have in their life and the relationships they cultivated. So that's what's really important. Yeah, and there was a, a very powerful moment in one of your videos where you were sitting down with a gentleman and he basically was the, the only survivor out of his friends and family members. And you asked him how that made him feel knowing that his friends have passed, his spouse has passed. And he said he feels lucky. And, you know, I found that so striking because I, I feel, you know, a lot of us would look at that perspective and say like, oh, he must be really sad. He must be really lonely. And to hear him say, no, I feel lucky. You know, I'm here. I'm talking to you. I'm having a great conversation. Like that was really powerful. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that goes into living your very old age is that there has to be a sense of gratitude and appreciation because if you wake up in a lousy mood all day, you know, chances are you're not going to live as old as you potentially could. So. Yeah. yeah, carrying that stress definitely damages your health and physiology. And, you know, I feel that one of the greatest lessons that we could learn from our elders is is truly how to be happy. I think everyone is searching for happiness. We all, we've talked about happiness on the show and how important purpose is. What were some of the lessons around happiness that, that you picked up from the elders? I think the greatest lesson I learned was from this lady. She was 111. So yeah, that, that, that qualified her as a super centenarian. So of the seven billion people on the planet, there's only about 60 people who are 110 or older. It's quite and the I, club. Yeah, yeah, it's a special club. They're hard to find. And I asked this lady, what were your secrets to health and longevity? And, and she said, sex, vodka, and spicy food. So that the joie de vivre is common in the oldest of all, that they do something each day that allows them to loosen their grip and, and enjoy life. Right, to really maximize that fulfillment instead of taking those small things and holding on to them. You know, I uh, cruising on social media, I always stumble upon, I think that there was the one African-American World War II vet who had passed away. Um, he was about 107, and he was smoking cigars and drinking beer up until his death. It's like right on. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the funniest, the oldest lady ever, her name was Jean Calmont. She lived to be 122. 
and she ate two pounds of chocolate a week, which isn't cigars, but right. still, you know, it's a lot of chocolate. <laughs> Absolutely a lot of chocolate. The secret to longevity. Here we go. You know, I was, it was that video that we were just discussing, and she had also been married five times, <laughs> and, my, you know. Johnny goes. My first thought was, <laughs> hell no. And I... I, I grew up in a family. My mom had been married twice. My dad, or I'm sorry, three times and my dad twice. And so, like, that's just, to me, when I see what tr train wrecks were going on, I've, my whole life has been avoiding this whole disaster. And, however, you know, she had mentioned of, of, of her life and being happy, and you had a, a nice anecdote to the end of it, which was, and, and, and if I get it wrong please uh help me here but it was that bad things don't happen um you can do it better well, just to, so just to clarify the 111 year old lady she was she also was very resilient because she'd been married five times yeah. and so what i say is that it's not that bad things don't happen to happy people but happy people happen to bad things so you know everybody gets knocked down i mean everybody gets their ass handed to them well my first thought in that is how do you make it to 111 if you've been married five times each one of those relationships had to had to take a toll yeah like, absolutely like now that, we know johnny's viewpoint yeah, on marriage yeah. <laughs> it's coming clear well, that's take 10 years off well there's another 15 off out of yeah, my life imagine how old she would have been <laughs> and she stayed single I, I think that that secret fact in there she did not have children so that probably added on i would save so. some years <laughs> lots of spicy food it sounds yeah. like oh yeah <laughs> yeah spicy food <laughs> now we're all about giving value to other people and we define value as attention appreciation and acceptance and i think going back to your point about the elderly and our elders is that a lot of times they are invisible in society they're not often walked up to and chatted up uh, we don't pay attention to what they're up to so you know i feel that for a lot of us, we think about, okay, I, I gotta make sure I get this person's attention because they're in a, a position of power or I wanna impress this person. But you did get a very powerful piece of advice from Antonia around how to show that acknowledgement to everyone so they can feel really good. Yeah, it was this lady who was happily married for many years and she said, this just great piece of relationship advice when somebody you care about walks in the room that she always makes eye contact with them. And I, I just don't think we do that anymore. You know, I mean, when we, someone walks in the room, you, you're probably looking at your computer or your TV screen, but to actually let someone know that you see them and you, you acknowledge them, it's uh, the best piece of, and the easiest relationship advice I've heard in a long time. Well, it's so powerful. Yeah, yeah. It's certainly after reading that, I was like, oh, hell yeah. I mean, the, what you send to that room and to, and to everybody there with just that, that small task is immense. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't take any effort, barely. <laughs> but, you know, it can be a struggle. Uh, Amy's yes. coming back from Atlanta today, and there are, she travels back and forth for work, and there are weeks where she'll come home, and, you know, I'm so in work, I'm not staring at the screen, and I'm sure she's feeling that. So that that's such a powerful tip of just, you know, for a second, someone you cared about walked in the room, drop what you're doing, and just look them in the eye. Yeah, I mean, that's it's one of the best questions to ask older people who are happily married is just like, what's the advice that you have for staying in this relationship? Cause it, you know, and the things that they say are, are worth their weight in gold. So valuable. So I know for myself, I'm curious, what are the pieces of advice for those who are in relationships who unlike Johnny want them to be successful <laughs> and add years to our life? Well, you know, I think the most powerful story was a guy who just had lost his wife and he spent, he was telling me the story about he sat by her bedside as she lay dying and he held her hand and they relived some of the greatest memories from their marriage. Surfing and, or going swimming in Waikiki and going golfing in Banff, Canada and their first date they had watching jazz. And he said he relived all these moments and you know it was exceptionally sad, but it was a special to be able to share that. And it, it made me think, you know, everyone's gonna have a day where they have to say goodbye to the one they love or they'll say goodbye to you. And mm -hmm. God willing, you'll be holding their hand. And it makes you think about, are you really appreciating the person that you spend your days with? I think we tend to take our partner for granted. You know, you just wake up next to him every day and 
gets it they they annoy you and they have the habits that drive you crazy but if you had to say goodbye to them imagine how you would feel and to look through the lens of an elder looking back and and just really wake up and appreciate the person that you spend all your time with and think about those moments that you do have together to be fully present you know going back to that device uh, how many times are we on our vacation with that loved one and we're still on our device and not yeah. present, not there? And when you look back on your deathbed or, or sadly on their deathbed, those are the moments that you're going to be holding on to and cherishing those yes. experiences together. Yeah. And, and it so, feel, sounds so dark to talk about the deathbed, but just to have a wake up story, like my best friend, my age and her husband, uh, 46 years old, great shape. It wasn't feeling good. Checked himself into the emergency room a few weeks ago. 30 minutes later, he was in a coma and septic shock and just like, you know, been in ICU for 30 days. I mean, this stuff can happen. And, you know, we have to live for today. And if you love someone, let them know you love them today. It sounds so cliche until you go through that and you don't want to go through that. Well, it's certainly, I mean, we've all heard the, the you know, a lot of times people within their life, they talk about not, not wanting to have regrets and, of course, uh, make trying to get squeeze out as much time with their loved ones as possible <laughs> I know for us you know we certainly don't want to have many regrets left on the table so we're putting it all out while we're here uh, and the one that's the more difficult is spending time with loved ones especially if they're across the country you know yeah I know for me when my dad passed you know we weren't on the greatest of terms our relationship was frayed due to my decisions to start the company and, and move out here and looking back, you know, there is an immense amount of regret that I didn't have those moments to just be honest and say, I love you, I appreciate you, all the support you've given, and just kind of took for granted that, oh, we'll still be arguing next week, we'll still be arguing next month, but it doesn't always work out that way. It doesn't work out that way, and I mean, I think you have to, that's why another great reason to talk to people who are older and ask them their regrets, and ask them how, what they, what, how you can learn from their mistakes. It's not just the things that they did right, and that, that'll wake you up as well. Now, for a lot of us, when we think of our elders, we think of them as pretty accomplished, having reached a level of success that maybe we're yearning for, we want to get to that point. Do you have any advice for our audience on how to turn these elders into mentors who can help guide us and shape us? I mean, I think we just have to recognize that there are older people all around us all the time, you know, and, and you're going to see maybe there's an older person living next door. If you're lucky enough to have a grandparent, the guy sitting alone at the airport waiting for his flight, the person behind you in line at Starbucks and to take a moment to stop and engage. It's not as hard as one might think. And nine times out of 10, they'll love the opportunity to talk with you. And that's it can all come from just that initial Hello. Yeah, and it starts with eye contact, right? That simple acknowledgement. Yeah. So if you're listening, acknowledge our elders who may be struggling in the grocery line or struggling to get across the street and hit the crosswalk button. I mean, those are great opportunities to just stop and acknowledge them. I th and certainly, I think a lot of young folk have an assumption that older people don't want to be bothered, that they're busy, they don't have time. We or that's for their family members to share those stories with. They don't want to be so honest and vulnerable with exactly. me. Yeah, I mean, what I always like to say is and put yourself in the shoes of an older person. You know, I mean, there's a loneliness that they might have lost their spouse. They've lost a lot of their friends. You can't just go to yoga class or go on a run because, you know, you're older and spend a lot of your time sedentary, just sitting at home. So for an, a young person to knock on your door and engage with you, it's so incredibly refreshing and they don't have many outlets left. They're desperate for some kind of connection, something that can wake them up and make them feel alive. And as a, fa a family member with uh, older family members myself, like to say, oh, it's just up to their family to hear those stories. I've heard those World War II stories <laughs> 20 <laughs> times at Thanksgiving. It's time for them to share it with a stranger, someone who may not have heard that story. Yeah, and, the, and the stories are unbelievable. I mean, I can reel off a hundred stories but it, once you engage and they start telling you it's from a different time in history and as i mentioned it's so it's such a different experience to hear it from somebody firsthand than to watch it on tv or read about it in a book and i would think it helps you with your listening it helps you with your patience you know we, we saw some of the technical difficulties you had with some of your interviewees right where you struggled at times to understand each other but that patience and being an attentive listener goes a long way towards building those social skills yeah it 
definitely requires slowing down. You're not going to get the quick <laughs> sound bite. Minute. You're not going to get the quick sound bite. You know, if I, well, I want to post a story on social media, it takes me a long time to kind of assemble and assimilate and digest everything. And there's one story that I'd love to share with you where I asked this 93 year old lady if she could send me a picture so I could share her story. And she said, oh yeah, I'll put it in the mail. And I was, you know, I was like, the mail, it'll take a week. Can't you just email it to me? <laughs> so she said, okay, well, my granddaughter has email. So I'll write down your email address. And it took me literally five minutes to, to share my email address. And at first I was really impatient and getting annoyed. I didn't have time for this. <laughs> and there was a certain breaking point where I just said, okay, this is funny and this is a generation gap and this is on me, not her. So you might want to listen or share that one. <laughs> Why? Wait, wait a minute. What? Okay. X? No, no, no. Y, like the letter Y. E, okay, Y. Then E, like eat. E, Y, E. A, like apple. <laughs> okay. H, like hat. Okay. Dave, D like David. Pardon? D? A, D like David. I got Y, E, A, H, now a D? Yes. Then an A like Apple. Yeah. A like Apple. <laughs> the at symbol, the Afro sand. The what? You know the at symbol, the Afro sand, the A with the circle around it? Like you have an email addresses. It's like, oh. You know how they do uh, that? Uh, an A. And he, okay, I got that. An A at like. Yeah, yeah. And then Mac.com. Yeah. So it's M like mom. <laughs> Mom.com. No, no, no. Mac.com. So it's M <laughs> like mom. Yeah. Then A like apple. Oh, wait a minute. You gave me an A before. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me tell you what I had. I had Y E A. H D. What are you laughing at? I'm. It's just funny trying to trying to do this because email is is not your generation, so it's so funny. The uh... I know I'm, I'm an old fart. <laughs> <laughs> that is wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, we well, all have those experiences. Well, what's oh, funny yeah. is I, I sense there's patience both ways in that interaction. Right, right. She's <laughs> being patient with you. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Now, were there situations, I, I do feel a number of our audience members encounter this with their elders where you were intimidated. Someone had received a lot of accomplishments. They obviously have had a very successful life where you went into the conversation feeling a little intimidated. You were laughing earlier if we were intimidated by Kobe Bryant. Did you experience those conversations with elders? I haven't. I've shied away from the people who have the big followings and who are famous. There's so many of them who are not known and deserve to have their stories told. So I've really kind of gone in a different direction. Maybe I eventually will be starstruck by somebody, but so far I've been kind of like digging into the shadows. Well, was it seems to me, to your point earlier, that a, a lot of our elders are just pretty humble. And were there moments of surprise where you weren't expecting to hear that type of story or accomplishment from someone the, you're talking to? The surprises, interestingly enough, were people who said they don't have anything important to share. But then they, you know, they were like a single mom who raised, put five kids on her own through college and just had great advice. Like she said, I was tough and strict as hell and I never stopped telling them how much I loved them. You know, and as a parent with a young children, you need those kinds of, um, those kinds of nuggets of wisdom are so meaningful. Yeah, absolutely. And let's talk about raising children. Obviously the elders have a wealth of knowledge around raising families, not only supporting their spouse. What were the lessons you learned as a parent that you could impart on our audience? Raise each child differently. Don't have like the, the parenting package that you wrap around <laughs> all your kids. Raise each child differently. Um, you know, the kids don't necessarily care that you spoil them with the nicest things. They just want to feel the love. They want to, you know, this one mother who could never make it to her kids' practices because she was always working. She said that, you know, she'd get home from her waitressing job and sit at their bed and rub their head and just 
be with them for two hours and they knew that she loved them and they knew that she was loving them the best she could when she could. And now she has a great relationship with them in their, in their adult life. And so, you know, those are the things, I mean, if you have kids, like it's hard raising kids and yeah. you, you know, don't always feel like you're doing it right. And you have some bad days and some good days and, <laughs> you know, and the bad days suck. Yeah. <laughs> So it's great to hear like, okay, I can do this. You know, I can do this. This is a formula that's manageable. Well, with, you know, with anything when you're dealing with people, I mean, it's, it comes down to art and parroting it's, is its own art form. And, you know, the, the suggestion of not raising your kids all the same, like raise them individually, uh, you know, that's, that's certainly going to go a long, well and a, a long way in allowing them to feel as an individual rather than you saying, well, listen, this worked for your older brother, this is going to work for you. I was going to say, yeah, that definitely led to some strife in my oh, household. Oh, <laughs> and in mine. Being treated exactly the same as your sibling can be very difficult. Yeah, yeah. So that was some great, some great wisdom. And, and, and listen, for every story that I tell about positive elders, you meet some grumpy, resentful, <laughs> worried elders, and you learn a lot from them. Too. What do you think are the biggest differences that lead to that? I think going back to our earlier point, you know, everyone wants to be happy. We're all seeking happy. But, you know, there are a significant number of us who are going to get to old age and, and not be happy, who are going to be grumpy. And what were your lessons from the, the grumpier, more negative elders? I mean, I think the biggest thing is like if you're a worrier when you're 32, you're going to be a worrier when you're 42 and a worrier when you're 62. And, the, and these conditions follow us. It's like just like with happiness, if you're attaching you're saying, I'll be happy when my kids get into school and I'll be happy when I lose weight and I'll be happy when, you know, uh, my show gets picked up and those conditions follow you and your whole life. So at a certain point, there has to be a, a moment where you make a change and you bust loose from the conditions that you attach to your life. Yeah. So instead of I'll be happy when it's I am happy, right? Yeah. It's changing yeah. it because when you, when you add the win, I will be happy when that's fleeting. A large portion of society looks at a lot of things in that manner and to only know that not only are they not going to clear up uh, the those patterns and pathways are only going to be even more hardened by the time you're 65 75 so no matter what age you are now time to get to work and let's talk about regret you know I'm I'm not quite an elder like Johnny but I I do have my <laughs> share of regrets what were some of the biggest regrets you heard from our elders that could help us get on the right path. I think the lo a lot of them you just were taking the partner for granted and then they die. You know, a lot of people in their, especially when you get into their 90s, are almost all of them are widows or widowers. And I think there's a lot of regret that you never think your partner's gonna die and then they die and it's a tragic thing and there's a lot of grief and they, would, they wish they could have those years back. So I think that's a big, that's a big, that's a big deal. I mean, I think with health, you know, there's that, there's this saying in the Western circumstance where you spend all of your wealth to, you spend all your health to gain your wealth and then you have to spend your wealth to regain your health. That's a common theme yeah. is that, you know, you wish that you took a little bit better care of yourself when you were younger because you pay the price when you're older. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of relationships with children that go awry and they lose contact for many years and then, you know, when, you, when you're old, you need, you need people to show up for you. You need to, you, and you want to be surrounded by people that love you. And if you didn't invest in your relationships when you were young and they're not showing up for you when you're old, it's, it's no fun. Yeah. And was there any advice around how to rekindle? I, you know, I know I've had strife in my family and I currently even have some family members that aren't talking. And I feel like every family goes through those struggles. Was there any advice that the elders had on how to you know, repair those broken relationships or mend those fences before that moment. There was one lady I met who had a near-death experience. She died for literally 20 minutes and she was in, the, in Egypt and she was telling me the whole story. She was like, her face was blue, her eyes were dilated. They're like, she's done, there's nothing we can do. And she shared the whole thing where she went through the, the tunnel and you know, it was the whole crazy experience that people talk about. And she said she came out of that with the, the revelation that honesty is everything. And honesty is just to be as honest as you possibly can be with the people that you care about. And that was what she said was very healing. There has been a, a lot of research with people getting to retirement age and then when 
retiring and then moving on and then feeling a bit useless after that point or that they're they're they don't have that their purpose is gone their purpose is gone and with that um did you get much advice on for the seniors who move beyond that and who move beyond that healthily and and happily well that's a big deal what you just mentioned i have a neighbor who's in his 60s and he's got plenty of money but he's worried sick because he can't get a job just to keep him busy he doesn't Mm -hmm. need a job to make money and he's worried sick that he's going to be bored the rest of his life so what you're talking about right now and the ageism and how people are squeezed out of the workforce it's, it's a big deal and it's a big struggle for people so there's a lot of chatter about that right now but it, it is a big issue yeah i mean you you look at centurions and mega centurions and super centurions and and 120 i mean the retirement age is 65 yeah 70 most of us will be retired so that's still a lot of years left a lot of mileage left to, to try to maximize. And it's like a lot of people feel like, oh, listen, just give them a set of golf clubs, let them learn how to golf, and that's what it'll do for them. And it's like, no, that's 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 not purpose. Right. <laughs> it's a hobby. Oh, yeah, the retirement <laughs> system, the, the kind of the template that we have where you retire when you're 65 and you go golfing the rest of your life. I mean, that's a flawed system. I, had a, I saw a lady in Starbucks who's an elder, and she said that she, all of her friends who followed that program, they're all dead now. So, you know, you have to stay engaged and you have to find a purpose and feel challenged. Yeah. And I think the the problem is that daydream is good while it's a daydream. But then when it's actually upon you, I know when, when my great uncle retired, he was itching to get back to work and do something Yeah, like that little honeymoon of retirement. We had a big party in his garage and he was all excited, talked about all this work he's going to do on the cottage. And, you know, he got through some of the work and he's like, okay, I, I got to get back to work. I got to do something. Yeah. He went back to driving trucks and we're like, you're retired. This is what you worked and, and grinded out for, for these moments. He's like, no, I need to get back behind the wheel. He, my dad's been retired for a good while now and he still puts in uh, 10 hours a week doing IT work for friends and, and just, just to stay busy, just to have that going on. And there's also the social component to that. Of course. Work, right? I feel like retirement for a lot of us does lead to that isolation. Even if you may not have purpose in work, you have coworkers that you can talk to and socialize with. And, you know, I know for us, that's one of the biggest reasons we've been running this boot camp for 12 years is even now, even the youth are isolated and they don't get social interaction. So imagine how isolating it is, you know, when you're retired and you don't have those opportunities. Yeah. And for entrepreneurs who are listening, there's tremendous opportunity to create businesses that engage the aging population. 10,000 people are turning 65 every single day. So the population's getting older and the, the baby boomer generation, they're not gonna stand for the isolation and you know being treated, put out to pasture. They're not gonna stand for it. I saw a really interesting article actually that all of the boomers who built these beautiful mansions on golf courses and reached this level of success, they're now selling those houses because they can't get up the stairs. They can't take care of it. It's just too big. And none of the millennials wanna buy them. Oh, they don't want to be so isolated. They don't want to be in the golf course. They don't want a palatial mansion. They want something a little bit more modest, a little bit more minimal. So we're now seeing all of this aging boomer population look at some of their life choices and realize, you know, maybe this wasn't for me. And now they're lacking in purpose. And and certainly a lot of those, the the homes in healthcare at that age is it's, it's certainly. Uh, expensive, and I had I just seen an article where there was a guy who managed to stay in a in a motel because it was cheaper, cheaper. than go, than going to an old age home. Did you see this article? No, no. he stayed at uh, Best Westerns. Yeah. I want to believe because he averaged it out. It was about sixty dollars a night, and he said the difference is that in a hotel they treat you like a customer. So <laughs> they get you the paper. It's always hot coffee. They're nice and bubbly when you're checking in. Oh, Mr. So-and-so, here's your room. <laughs> He's like, you go to a retirement home and you're a patient. That's a different type of service. Yeah. So he's like, I didn't want the bedpan and I didn't want all of that medical stuff around me. So he traveled the country staying in hotels and it ended up being cheaper than if you were to go to a retirement home. That's interesting. And the whole retirement home system is so wackadoodle because you know there's these dead spots in our communities i mean you drive by retirement homes and we wouldn't ever stop to 
knock on the door and see how people are doing. You know, they have thousands of years of history in those places, but they're completely isolated from the rest of the community. So that has to change. There's a, a powerful form of meditation that you do at your Drinks with Elders events that I think even would inspire our audience. And can you share what this meditation is? Yeah, so it's just a, a visualization. If, if you wanna try it with me, just take okay. a moment and close your eyes and imagine, I'm just gonna go way forward in the future and imagine you're older, a lot older, and you just had your 90th birthday. And so your friends and your family, your grandchildren, maybe you had a few great grandchildren, they came over, they celebrated, you had a great cake, and then everyone leaves. And you sit down after a long night and a little bit of loneliness starts to set in. You, because you're 90, you recently lost your partner of many years. Now you pick up the phone because you want to say hi to your friends, but a lot of your friends have passed away by the time you're 90. And your kids, don't, they don't live in the same town, so you won't see them for a while. Your, your grandchildren, you might not see them for months. And so you start to feel this kind of, this loneliness. You can't just wake up and go on a run the next day because you're, you're a lot older now. You can't just run to yoga class. And so the loneliness can sometimes be very oppressive and you're not sure what to do, who to call, where to go. And then you get a knock on the door and it's, your neighbor who's in their thirties and they, they show up and they want to ask you to share your story and they want to invite you over to, to share with their friends. And you can imagine how refreshing that is in the situation that you're in. So just to sometimes put yourself in the shoes of, and what it's like to get older. And, and I, I believe a lot in karma and how, how you treat people when they're older, we'll say a lot about how you're treated when you're older. It's a powerful exercise to really think about that. I think a lot of us are so in the here and now and our devices and know where I'm going on vacation. It, it's even difficult for us to visualize that far into the future. Yeah, and I think we, we don't think about it. It's sometimes there's a lot of fear in, in aging and you look at someone who's older and it's scary. You don't want us to have to think about it. But it is part of life and with technology and medicine, a lot of us are gonna to live to be very old. So I think it's important to understand what that's like and to have empathy when you're young and start to nurture those connections now so that you keep that going as you get older and you feel like you're integrated in the community. Now, I know with my dad's passing and, and my grandfather's passing, one of the, the most difficult parts in their lives were their loss of mobility. My dad had an injury to his neck that he lost feeling in his arm. And I do feel that for a lot of us, as we age, mobility is going to become a really important factor in, in our quality of life. Obviously you practice yoga. Was there anything that you learned from our elders who were limber and who were in great shape that could help us maintain that physical side of things so that we can have the movement and be able to, to live a long, happy and fulfilling life? I mean, there's certain kinds of exercise that'll just crush you. I mean, running is so hard on your body, you know, and most of the time you don't see people that live to be very old who were runners. Now I, my in-laws are runners and if they're hearing this, they're probably like, <laughs> it's bullshit. <laughs> but the pounding is just so intense, so, like, it's right? so intense. And you know, you have to think in terms of longevity the stretching is much healthier and then you wanna be agile. You know, I mean, I think the yogis say you can tell how healthy somebody is, not by the shape of their body, but by the agility of their spine. And I think that really carries into old age. Yeah, your ability to pick things up as you get older. <laughs> totally. <laughs> comes totally. down to exactly that. And for a lot of us, we're not thinking about those things, right? We're yeah, I mean, like having a bicep the size of your head, I mean, what's the practicality of that? Well, know? it's great if you're an influencer like Johnny, but <laughs> you know, that, that fades. <laughs> so you're gonna wanna be able to move. You're gonna wanna be able to hang out with your grandchildren and actually get on the floor and get up and pick things up. And, and that is something that wanes as we get older. Yeah, and I think even more than the physical 
health is the mental health and how you exercise your mind and you know like just gratitude there's this leading researcher on gratitude and he says that gratitude you have to be a badass to be grateful because gratitude is morally and intellectually demanding Mm -hmm. you know it's easy to wake up and fixate on all the stuff that you got to get done and it's hard to wake up and shift your focus to everything that's good in your life and so just mental strength is really important as well yeah and when you're in a state of gratitude you can't have any other emotional feelings you're strictly in gratitude unlike you know multitasking i can be afraid i can be angry but when you're focused on gratitude and being grateful that's the only state that you can be in well it, it yeah and the whole thing about it shifting on, on focus of of what you have rather than what you don't have and it's certainly a, a, it, it is a shift and it does uh, it does take patience and it does take work to be able to do that and I, I certainly know uh when I had learned about appreciation and started practicing it, I know that not only did my thoughts about where I was in life change, but how I woke up and approached every day changed. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's an everyday practice. It's so easy to focus on what you need and what you don't have. One of my favorite quotes is this, to think you need something you don't already have is a form of insanity. And I think it's true. I mean, your whole life you could be searching for the things you don't have. and how are you going to appreciate the things you hope to have in the future if you can't appreciate what you have right this moment? So, And I think for a lot of us, taking a step back and thinking about where we were you know, as a kid, where we were just five years ago, allows us to actually find that stuff to be grateful for. Yeah. Because a lot of us are present, forward-looking, thinking about the future and what we don't have. And time, and time again, we just have to take a step back and realize, well, you know, four years ago, I couldn't run this fast. I couldn't lift this much weight. I couldn't talk to this many people. I didn't have this level of confidence at work. So it is looking backwards to see just how far you've come to find that gratitude. And we love the five-minute journal. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I have it, yeah. yeah. It's great. It's a fantastic practice, morning and evening, it, a few prompts. You fill it out every single day, and it really reinforces the gratitude. And it does. It's been scientifically shown to lift your mood and change your mental health, which I think is huge as we get older. It, it's huge. And, and like I was trying to paint the picture when you're 90 and – you may not have the agility to get around, but if your mind is fit and strong, that's that's really important because you're going to be spending a lot more time with your thoughts. And if you have beautiful thoughts, it's going to be a beautiful life. If your thoughts are going down a black hole, it's going to be a struggle. Well, and certainly we we were just discussed, and you were mentioning them. If that's if you were a warrior at forty, imagine what that is going to look like at sixty five. So it's no time like the present than to get. Uh, positivity training and, and getting that fixed, that wiring I mean, fixed out. Change is difficult. Transforming yourself, we're actually going to, it's going to be an upcoming theme month for us, transformation, but transformation is hard. Change is very hard. A lot of us are set in our ways. What was the biggest transformation you saw or witnessed from an elder who just in their youth were one way and then as they aged, they, they changed? Oh, wow. That's a good question. I have to think about that one. I didn't I didn't write a lot about the elders that transformed. I think the more interesting part was looking through the lens of an elder and seeing their perspective, looking back over their life and what they see as the important moments that stood out across 80, 90, 100 years. And I mean, one, you know, everybody over that span of a lifetime goes through hell. They have, you hit rock bottom, you go through hell. Not all of the elders ever bounce back from that. That's a decision that you have to pick yourself up and bounce back. A lot of them, they stayed down for years, and that usually manifested as some kind of illness or disease. So the, the, the wherewithal to pick yourself up and keep trucking, that's an important one. I mentioned uh, just the value that you place on relationships and community is really important. If you spend a lot of alone time, it tends to, to wear on you as you get older. So it's really like looking through the, from the lens of an elder looking back on their life. Another interesting thing that I learned is I would always ask if they're scared of death because when you're 80, 90, 100 years old, any breath could be your last. Right. And honestly, not one time did they say they were scared to die and most of the time they said they welcomed it. And I thought that was really, really interesting because death is a scary subject in our culture. Yeah, I definitely feel like just thinking about it, that it's scary for me as I sit here. So I, I can't imagine getting to that place. But 
you know, that's just it, that resiliency and understanding how to be grateful for the life that you have and all of the things you've been able to accomplish, I would assume allows you to get there. Yeah. And also, you know, in, in yoga, the, the Shavasana is like the most wonderful part of yoga. It's the, the corpse pose or the death pose and learning to just relax into that peace is the feeling that you kind of sense is what happens when when older people are approaching the end. It's not this scary, anxiety-ridden thing, but it's like a, a sense of peace. Now, one last question before we go. We had author Charles Duhigg on a few months back, and he did a lot of research on habits, and we asked him, all of this research, everything you learned, how did it change your behavior? What lessons did you take from the elders that you applied directly to your life and changed behavior, whether it was in your parenting, your health, any of that? When I get in a fight with my wife, we end it. I mean, just like we got a quick conflict resolution. Like it's not worth it taking, taking it a step further than that. So we end it right away. Um, I just try to show up for my kids and be present with them as best I can. And sometimes, you know, I get down on myself that I'm not getting them like the fanciest things or taking them in the fanciest places. But I think some of the greatest moments are just, just being there and letting them know that I'm there with them. I see them, I hear them, I feel them. Um, and I think more than anything, it's just that happiness is what you can find in this moment and not looking to some future moment or some complicated for a formula you apply to your life because those things make it really make it hard. So just keeping it simple um, and realizing that I'm blessed and just to appreciate my life as it is right this moment and not hoping it, it changes for some future moment. And what are your conflict resolution tips with your spouse? To own the, the issues that I have in the moment to but be willing to apologize and not have a lot of like pride in my relationship and defensiveness ego. Yeah. And to play as a team. Um, you know, I love the Phil Jackson's book, 11 rings. And he talks about like tribal relationship stages of the tribal relationship. And, you know, family is a team and learning to play as a team and get on the same page and check my ego at the door and just have honest communication and, and not take it to bed, not take the, the fighting to bed with us. Well, thank you so much for yes. joining us. Thank you for taking the time to speak to our elders and write this fantastic book. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be with you guys. I appreciate it's it. It's great having you. Is there anything that you want to plug on the show? Or yeah. Yes. So the if you go to davidromanelli.com, you'll see I have a, a, up, I have a new slate of drinks with your elders intergenerational events coming up soon. And my book is called Life Lessons from the Oldest and Wisest. It's a great read for any age, whether you're 15 or 95, and it's got something for everybody. You can get it at Amazon, get it from my website, Barnes and Nobles. Thank you so much. Right on. And we're gonna be checking out one of your drinks with elders. Yes. Johnny might be on stage. Love it. Sharing some info. <laughs>